today, my film photography guide for beginners. We're going to travel from California to Hawaii to Iceland, Canada, and Denmark and talk all about how you can get started in film photography. I'll give you my recommendations for starter cameras, the best types of film, how to load your camera, how to meter and focus so you get the best images possible, and where and how to get your film processed and scanned. First up, let's head on and talk about the best cameras. Welcome to the tutorial. The first thing you're probably wondering is which camera you should get. There are a number of great cameras. I have a lot in front of me. You may see a lot of expensive cameras being used, especially if you're looking at film photography here on YouTube. And uh, the bonus with film is that the film that you load into the camera is the sensor. So whatever the film you're putting in, you can put the same film in uh, a Leica as you can a Canon AE-1 that'll cost you, uh, I don't know, this is roughly maybe $150, whereas this M6 has just gone up in price astronomically. At the end of the day, they are still exposing light to the same film. So if you put Portra 400 in there, you're going to get a Portra 400 feeling image. So even an inexpensive camera can get fantastic results. To simplify things a little bit, so there is basically the, the digital SLR that you're probably familiar with seeing. Um, that I would say is the most common 35 millimeter film camera. There are also uh, 35 millimeter point and shoots, as well as medium format cameras, as well as range finders. And while we will be talking about a few of these different cameras throughout the tutorial, uh, if you are just looking to get started, something like this Canon AE-1 will definitely get you on your way or something like a Pentax K1000 or an Olympus OM-1 or something like a Minolta X700. Those are all fantastic cameras to start. And remember, whatever film you're loading in, at the end of the day, that is the sensor that you are using, essentially. I know that's kind of oversimplifying it, but that's, that's kind of what it is. This is going to take a pretty close to as good of image as something that is way more expensive. So uh, you don't have to spend your entire fortune and mortgage your house to uh, get into film photography. This is a film camera. It's Canon AE-1. On the front of your camera, this number here is the focal length. This is a prime lens. It does not zoom. This number here is the largest, the widest f-stop. We're going to talk a lot more about that. This is how you adjust your f-stop. It is currently set to f5.6. You can rotate it. The front grippy wheel here is your focus. It is currently set to infinity. It also gives you feet and meters, but you can also just look through the viewfinder to, to do that. You don't gotta, you got, don't gotta do math. In the top corner there, the, the green 400 is the ISO. I have 400 ISO film in there, so I've set it to 400. Here is your shutter speed, the little line beside the 250th of a second. Uh, this is the button you press to take the photo. That one's pretty obvious. This is where the battery goes. Some cameras have a secret second battery somewhere, so make sure you have both batteries if required. Here is the little arrow for how to rewind your film manually, because you're probably going to have to rewind your film manually. This is where the film goes, and uh, this is where you, you pull it across to. We'll do a, an actual example in a few minutes. And this is the viewfinder that you stick your face in to see what picture you'd be taking. And also, very important on the back, you can rip off a piece of the box from your film and put it in, because if you put your camera down for a week, you're probably going to forget what film was in it, and you might be like, I'll never forget, but trust me, you'll forget. Oh, we almost forgot this, this little out-of-focus lever here is how you advance your film. Now on to talk about some film stocks. That's a weird memory card. Oh look, a wild Pierre T. Lambert, and Donna did it. Donna did it in a puddle. Here's a picture of Donna. This is Kodak Ektar, overexposed by one stop. When it comes to film, you have a number of things to consider. Uh, most film is balanced for daylight. Uh, so if you're shooting a digital camera, it's kind of balanced for somewhere in between kind of that sunlight and cloudy uh, setting that you might have. Uh, Portra 400. Um, I guess, I don't know if it's a joke or not, but it feels like it's real. If there's yellow on the box, usually that means that there's going to be a yellow kind of overtone to the film. If there's blue on the box, that might mean some blue cast. If you're looking at Fuji film, um, a lot of that is green and you'll notice that it does a lot of great things for your greens as well as just kind of has a little bit of greens in the shadow. There's a, there's a lot of films to figure out, which is both positive and negative. You find you can find the one that you want, but it might take you a little while. Uh, so do some research on the internet and make, make a list of kind of top three. I would say if you have the budget, Portra 400 is a great place to start. I would consider this to be the standard film that most photographers are incredibly familiar with, and it's just kind of that go-to. Um, I find that this is my go-to in most situations. Um, we'll talk about over the rest of the video some other times that I would choose a different film type, um, but Portra 400 is a great place to start. It comes in 
medium format as well. So if you want to shoot 120, and we'll talk about the differences between 120 uh, medium format and 35 millimeter different section in this video. Some other things to consider with film, portrait 400. So 400 is the light sensitivity and the higher the light sensitivity, the higher the number. Something like this Cinestill 800T, 800 is more sensitive than 400, uh, or this Cinestill 50D, um, so 50 ISO, so a lot less sensitive to light. Uh, so if you're out on a bright day, you're able to use this. As soon as it starts to get a little bit darker, it is a lot harder to use something like this 50D, unless you happen to have a tripod. There are a lot of different color films and also black and white films. Uh, you have to select in, in film photography if you are going to be photographing the scene in color or if you're going to be in black and white. Uh, something like this T-Max 400. Again, 400 being the speed of the film. You can get Ilford 3200 ISO if you want, 3200. Um, and essentially kind of what it does, the more light sensitivity that it has, typically the more grain you're going to see. So Ilford 3200, you're going to see a heck of a lot of grain on that. Whereas something like this T-Max 400 or Tri-X 400 um, that I, I personally prefer. You're going to see a little bit less grain or there are some Lomo film stocks that are uh, that are basically eight ISO. So you're going to see very, very limited grain, um, but they do become a little bit more difficult to shoot just simply because they are a lot less sensitive. If I had to pick my two go-tos for film, whether it is 35 millimeter or it is uh, 120 medium format, I would say Portra 400 is number one on that list for color film and Tri-X, I don't have a Tri-X here. Uh, Tri-X 400 is my go-to for black and white. Those two films together, I am incredibly happy with. Um, we're in Hawaii, so I didn't really bring a whole lot of black and white to give you a black and white demo. Um, but over the next couple of days, we're definitely going to be taking lots of pictures on Portra, as well as a few other color film stocks. So the most common lens you're going to get with a film camera of the style Canon AE-1 is going to most likely come with this 50 millimeter lens. If you're buying a camera online, make sure that it has in fact been tested so that you're getting a working camera. Uh, what I kind of do to make sure that my camera is working as I would expect it to is I open the back. Uh, there's film in this right now, so never, as soon as you put film in it, never open the back. But I open the back and I make sure that when I'm hitting the shutter button, that it at least appears to be changing shutter speed. So if you're at a shutter speed, say one one thousandth of a second, you hit the shutter button and it's a very fast shutter that you can just see a little bit of light through, that's good. And then when you slow it down to something like one second and you hit the shutter button, it better stay open for longer than that first little blip of light that you saw. Uh, hopefully it stays open for one second. When it comes to other lenses you can get for your cameras, I like to get a 35 millimeter lens if possible. You can get wider if you're interested maybe in street photography, including a lot more in your scene. But I find personally a 35 is usually wide enough for most situations. It also allows me to get a little bit of that depth of field separation, a little bit of background blur. And then if you are into more, say portraits or maybe bigger landscapes, it might be important to get a longer lens as well. And by longer, I mean more millimeters. So maybe something like an 85 or a 90 or even a zoom like a 70 to 200. And that way you're able to get a little bit closer to the final image you want if it is something that's a little bit further away. If you are looking at a first camera, I would say a 50 or a 35 millimeter lens would be a good place to start. It actually looks really nice over there. I should have brought color film. Loading your camera is pretty similar regardless of which camera you use, if it is an SLR or a rangefinder. Uh, they all have kind of the same principles or roughly the same principles. There is probably a secret hidden lever here like this. Just pull that up and uh, you just do that to pop the back up. If that does not exist, there might be something on the side here that you can easily just pop the back open and uh, you're ready to load your film. So after you've opened the camera, there's likely a spool on this side that you're going to have to load the film in and a place for your film to sit comfortably right here. So press that down and get your film in there and just simply pull it across. And on the other side here, you can see that there is a take up spool. So you place the film in here or something similar. And at that point you advance the film. So you can hit the shutter button and advance and it should get caught like that. You wanna make sure that it is catching and that it is rotating. Hit the shutter button again 
and make sure that everything is good. You wanna make sure that the gears here are in the correct positioning and they are going to be advancing your film. And most cameras also have an, some sort of way to actually show you that the film is advancing. This little dial here should move whenever you advance the film. Once you're confident that the film is advancing properly, um, I tend to probably maybe do a few additional shots just due to anxiety. You can close the back of your camera and you will want to do a few photos. There should be a reader that says, um, eventually it'll say a zero or the number one. Uh, right now it says S, which means I need to do a few more advances to get to zero. And now that the camera's at zero, I'm ready to go. To speak about the basics of photography, they're the same whether you're shooting digital or film. And it kind of breaks into a triangle with ISO being one of the pieces, aperture being the other piece, and shutter speed being the third piece. And what they do is they all come together to make something called exposure. Exposure is how much light in the film photography case is exposing to the film. And you want it to be pretty close to whatever you want your photo to actually look like. You do have a little bit of leverage. If you underexpose, you overexpose, the lab can fix it. But you do want to make your final exposure as close to you want it as possible. To speak about the first piece of the triangle is ISO and ISO in this case is just controlled by your film um, the, in this case we're using 400 triax so 400 is the number of ISO so you're kind of just stuck to that and when it comes to ISO numbers 400 is a pretty good general number to talk about the second piece of that triangle um, and they are by no means in the order that are the the most important um, the second is aperture so what aperture is is essentially you can kind of see here that as I close the aperture of the lens it lets less light in. So something like this is what we call wide open, which is F2 on this lens's case. Um, and then down here around F22, uh, the, you can see the opening gets very, very small. So your lens will likely have a maximum aperture. The smallest number is considered the maximum aperture. I know, confusing. Uh, F2 on this lens, which means that it's letting in lots and lots of light, as you can see. And as you, we call it stopping the lens down, you're making the aperture a little bit smaller, which is increasing the number. And down around F22, all of a sudden the aperture is very, very small and letting in not nearly as much light as it would be wide open. What this means for you and your exposure, if you are in a darker environment, you're obviously going to want to be letting in as much light as you possibly can. So in combination with ISO, a higher ISO film, as well as leaving your lens wide open at something like F1.8 or F2, uh, you're going to be letting in lots of light to get that proper exposure that you want. Just to punch in here for a moment, aperture also controls your depth of field. Uh, so if you're at a smaller f-stop number, an f, say 1.2 or an f2, you're going to see that out of focus background. Whereas if you go to, down to something like an f8, like this image here, all of a sudden everything is a lot more in focus. And to add two more variables, sorry if it gets confusing, focus distance, the closer the subject is, uh, the blurrier the background is going to be, as well as focal length. So if you're using a longer lens, the background will be blurrier as well. So basically, if you want the blurriest background possible on a portrait, you want that subject as close to your lens as it will allow you to focus on. You want to be on a longer lens like a 50 millimeter or an 85 or a 135. And you want to make your lens as wide open as possible. Um, assuming that you have a good quality lens, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that right now. In fact, if you are using more vintage equipment, uh, stopping your lens down will add more sharpness to the final image. Um, if you're shooting wide open, you might start to notice that even though things are in focus, that things feel a little bit too soft. Once you get down to something like F4, you're going to be more in the sweet spot of the lens, which basically allows it to create sharper images for you. Uh, newer lenses are designed pretty much as good at wide open as they are at something like F22. Um, but I would say for vintage lenses, somewhere around F4 to F16 is kind of that sweet spot. If you are using a higher ISO film, say for instance, you load 400 ISO film into here and then you go out and it goes from this cloud to direct bright sun, uh, what you're going to have to do to compensate for that is simply make your aperture something like f16 rather than f4 um, to compensate for the extra light that's coming in in order to make the exposure overall a little bit darker. And this leads us into the third section, uh, shutter speed. So shutter speed is the third key. You have your, your ISO, so you're setting your film sensitivity is just set. You have your aperture if you're letting in lots of light. If you're in a bright environment, you need to make it a little bit darker. And then the last option you have for your exposure is shutter speed. What your shutter speed is, is it is the length of time that your shutter is actually open. If you're using an SLR camera, the reason it's called an SLR is this mirror here. One one thousandth of a second looks something like that. It's really, really quick and it lets that light quickly onto your film and then closes the shutter. Something like one second down here, the shutter is going to be open for a little bit longer. It's going to let in lots of light. 
So when you are in a darker environment, not only are you going to want to be wide open, you're going to want to balance your shutter speed to also let in lots of light. If you are in the bright sun, something like one one thousandth of a second, is probably good enough. Uh, the negative with going slower, if you need to let in more light, at some point you're going to get a little bit of handheld shake. I would say if you're shooting something like a 50 millimeter lens to ideally never go below one slash 30th of a second. Uh, the general rule that you'll read about online, if you're shooting say this 50 millimeter lens, you should be at a shutter speed of one slash 50th of a second or higher. I found that I can get pretty good results at one slash 30th of a second, um, even one 15th of a second if I absolutely need to. But those are kind of the general rules. So those are the three keys to getting the correct exposure in photography. You want your ISO to give the right light sensitivity based on your environment, your aperture, either wide open or stop down a little bit depending again on the environment and your shutter speed. Again, if you're in a bright condition, you're at one one thousandth of a second, maybe one five hundredth of a second. Or if you're in darker conditions, you're going to want to let a little bit more light in. And it really is kind of a balancing act that if you bring your shutter speed down and you let in more light that way, uh, you can compensate for that by making your aperture something like f4 rather than f2.8. And over the rest of this video, we will be doing a number of examples with how I troubleshoot scenes and where I find that balance. briefly about metering and exposures. Uh, we're going to kind of walk through an AE-1 setup, which is what's kind of more a shutter priority where you set the shutter speed and figure everything else out, as well as a rangefinder that is aperture priority. So depending on which camera you have, uh, hopefully you have a meter in your camera. If you don't, we'll talk about that at the end. So this Canon AE-1 and I guess any film camera, the ISO is going to be set by whatever film you load into this camera. There are exceptions, but they're a little more advanced. We'll talk about that later in the video. So in here, portrait 400, which means I'm setting my ISO on my camera to 400. And then from there, I typically select a shutter speed. So out here, I know I'm shooting at uh, 400 speed film and I might go to one slash 1,000th of a second here on this Canon AE-1 and just kind of hold the camera up. And whenever you press the button halfway, it'll give you a meter reading. So the meter will drop down from the top and it will tell you, you should shoot this photo at F16. There's no film in this camera, but you get the idea. To set your aperture, it's usually on the front ring here. And this goes from 1.8, F1.8, all the way to F16. And some cameras will actually have an automatic mode as well. So this Canon AE-1, you can actually set it to A mode. So it'll just set everything for you. Um, so you can shoot this in full automatic if you want. Again, shutter priority. So you're selecting the shutter speed you want, you're holding down, and it will still give you the meter reading. So basically what you want to look out for is if your frame is going to be too dark, it's going to have the meter all the way at the bottom of this camera. And it's going to be kind of telling you like uh, maybe a flashing light or something to be like, by the way, you're not getting enough light in. And if that's the case, you got to make your shutter speed a little bit slower to let a little bit more light in. Today out here on a day like this in the rain, apparently, uh, if you are shooting something like one eighth of a second, which is letting a lot of light in than the shutter, and you're looking through here, the light meter is actually not going to move. It's going to be maxed out still at F22 because it's looking for you to close down the aperture even more than F22 in order to get a photo that's going to be properly exposed. Moving into this medium format rangefinder, uh, a lot of rangefinders will work similar to this or maybe even your, your SLR. Uh, there's also, I guess, uh, a, there's a lot of different ways that a light meter can work. So make sure you read your manual. You can usually find them online if your camera didn't actually come with a manual. This rangefinder works in aperture priority or full manual. Uh, what aperture priority means is that rather than setting your shutter speed, there's actually an A mode. So you can just set it to automatic. Your camera chooses what shutter speed it wants. And it works kind of the inverse of what I just showed you with the shutter priority on the AE-1. So you're outside and you know that you have maybe 400 speed film in your camera. So that's going to be very sensitive and it's going to capture a lot of light for you. Uh, and you're Th looking at the scene, you're like, I'd love to have lots of depth of field. And your aperture is what controls depth of field. So you set it to F16, you want the entire scene in focus, and you hold the camera up to your face, and it's telling you a reasonable number that makes sense for the scene if you're trying to capture something that's still motion, and it is giving you a one slash 500th of a second, that's totally fine. Similar to the way the AE-1 works, that if it is giving you, uh, not necessarily an error, but it might be an arrow pointing that like it can't 
open the shutter long enough to actually get an exposure or the opposite that it, the scene is too bright and the shutter speed can't go fast enough uh, it will give you an indication of that and if you are controlling your exposure essentially with aperture you can kind of play around with that that if you need more light that the camera's telling you it needs more light you can go down to f4 or if it is too bright you can go all the way up to f22 and then when you're ready you hold the camera up and you take the photo is that let's talk about focusing next When it comes to focus, it's pretty simple with this Canon AE-1. There will be a center patch. It's kind of a little difficult for me to document, but when you look through, you'll get it. And basically, you move the focus left to right, and you find what you want to be in focus, and you stop there. Um, there's a little split diopter that you'll see kind of the, the lines come together, and then the centerpiece will be in focus. And at that point, you know that, it, like, just stop touching it, go up take the photo. And with this camera, anything that you're seeing through the viewfinder, since you are looking directly through the lens, will actually end up on the film. So your frame is everything that you can see within there. You can also do a thing called zone focusing, where you actually look at the numbers on here. And if you know that what you're looking for is somewhere within kind of this range right here, um, you can set it to five meters and know that I'm going to be photographing something that's about five meters away. Uh, a lot of street photographers work this way, that they're not always looking through the viewfinder that they just kind of know where their focus range is. Um, it's definitely a skill to develop. Uh, it's not something that comes super easy, um, but if you are stopped down, you'll have lots of depth of field. You don't really have to focus on each individual image. You kind of know that where your focus bounds are. Um, I shoot a lot, at least landscapes, on infinity. So my lens is just set to infinity focus, uh, which means that it's getting kind of everything in focus once it gets to a certain point. And that point is usually maybe five to 10 feet away from the camera. So if I'm trying to take a photo of Marshall like this, the background's all going to be in focus and Marshall is not. But if I set my camera to something like one meter or 3.5 feet, which is kind of the minimum focus distance on this lens, and I take that photo, Marshall will be in focus and the background will be softly, beautifully out of focus. Metering on a day like this is a little bit easier. It's overcast, so you're gonna find that one setting and use the automatic meter in here and kind of meter off something that's, uh, you're not, you don't wanna point your camera right at the sky or maybe right at the ground below you, but point it at something that you can kind of read that seems like kind of the, the, what you would want to expose for. And there's a pretty good chance that your frame's gonna to come together. So we're going to load in Portra 400, 120 into this. Is it raining? Don't put water in your camera. Also on the front, you'll notice here that I have a one quarter black pro mist. It's a filter that you screw onto the front of your lens and it makes it feel like it's a little bit more of a foggy morning. So we're cheating a little bit, um, just diffusing the light as it goes through into the, into the film. I really enjoy um, the soft feeling of photos, not out of focus, but I enjoy softer photos in general. Uh, so that's kind of what we're trying to do here uh, with a little bit of help from, from the optics. There's a lot of good options for photos. This camera fortunately has a built-in light meter that is fully functional, uh, which means that it'll tell me what exposure should be and I can make adjustments or I can actually set it to automatic mode and it'll just select the right shutter speed for me. Uh, what I've actually done is I've chosen to overexpose my film. So rather than using, if you're on a digital camera or some SLRs, uh, you have an exposure compensation tool where you can go plus one stop, minus one stop. And basically all that does is it lets in a little bit more light or a little bit less light. Uh, what you can also do if you don't have that plus minus button, is you can just set your film to a different speed. So I've set my light meter to read from 200 ISO, which means it's going to let a little bit more light in than if it was just trying to meter for 400 ISO, which is what the film is in here. So everything is going to be overexposed by one stop. But I think that for the, I guess, the warm feeling sunset images, I feel like it really does make for a better image overall. Um, again, season to taste. If you like the underexposed look with the really vibrant sky, um, that is an option too. If you want to go for the more washed out, uh, kind of more painterly colors, for lack of a better description, um, overexposing a little bit on Portrait 400 is the way to kind of unlock that from the film. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing when it comes to metering. There is a lot to learn when it comes to reading light. I would say that's probably the hardest part about film photography or digital photography for that matter. When I walk into a scene, my ISO is already set. 
I select a reasonable aperture for the scene, so maybe f4 in this case when it's nice and overcast, or maybe 5.6. A little bit more higher number will give you a little bit more sharpness, as well as depth of field. So this photo coming up here is shot at f8, which means you can see a lot of that background detail as well. From there, your shutter speed just kind of falls into place. One important thing, maybe the one of the more important lessons to take from this video is that it is much better to overexpose your film just by a little bit, not completely overexposed, but to err on the side of overexposure rather than underexposure. Uh, underexposure is going to give you a lot of grain and the it's just not going to be the best scan. Whereas if you overexpose, it's usually a little bit easier to be saved, which is kind of the opposite of shooting digital. Now, where do you get your film scanned and developed? There are a few avenues. You can do it yourself. You can send it to a pro lab or you can send it to maybe a local drugstore style lab or maybe an elevated drugstore style lab. Developing yourself, obviously I can't teach you all that in this video. I don't even do it myself. For a local lab, you will probably get a pretty good develop most of the time. So if you want to just take those and learn to scan them yourself, you can do that through your, maybe if you have a digital SLR or mirrorless camera, you can scan them yourself. Or if you're looking at kind of the professional side of things and you want to have that proper pro level scan, we use Richard Photo Lab. All the photos that you've seen throughout this video have all been both developed and scanned by Richard Photo Lab. And I do the Richard's way, which is um, basically just let them have full control over the scan. And I barely touched anything in any of the photos that you saw. So the scans that come back are just perfect and ready to go most of the time. So uh, shout out to Richard. They didn't sponsor this video, but they did sponsor a bunch of the content that you saw in the video in the film photography road trip series. And we're coming back for season two. So look forward to that in the next couple of months. And the playlist is on the screen now. If you want to go check out some more stuff, there's a lot of good tips within this film photography road trip series, as well as just some, some good talking about traveling and, and living life. And it's mostly eating pizza. Start with the Iceland episode. We put a lot of effort into it and we really did have a heck of a lot of fun making that episode. So uh, check that out if you're interested. Drop any questions you have in the comments also. I'm happy to get back to you or if I don't know the answers, maybe somebody else will be able to. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.